Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars. Um, you know, it's a terrific Florida Thursday. I can't argue. I can't complain. Well, I will for a minute. I mean, basically, it's this. We've had a week of terrific weather. I mean, it's been cold. This is the weather that I wait for and hope for. Uh, there were three days we were in the 30s. I mean, it was just absolutely fantastic and uh, a true joy. I mean, I actually had to put pants on and I wore a light jacket. I mean, it was just... It was just everything that I had hoped for. And now we're going into a week in the mid-80s, and it's going to be hot in the middle of the day and all of that crap. But after having that week, I just am so chipper. I can't, I can't complain. And it's still we're having nice mornings. It's probably in the low 60s right now. Uh, I drove over here to Peter's with the top down. It was great. And, uh, you know, I'm going to get into work and get in the air conditioning before it gets hot. So. So uh, no complaints about the weather at all. Uh, somebody mentioned the lack of animals uh, lately in the, in the comment. And, you know, I have to agree. They haven't been around. You know, Peter had threatened to get new goats, but obviously he didn't because I haven't been molested by any. Uh, I haven't even seen a rabbit. I mean, uh, the, an eagle flew overhead the other day and an owl came perilously close. It really swooped down. It was probably you know, a hundred feet away. And, you know, who knows what that thing would do to your face if it wanted to. But uh, otherwise, animals have even been at an absolute minimum. Not even that weird dog that was here a couple times has been around. So, uh, you know, I, I, there's not even a bird in the trees. With any luck, they froze to death over the last week. So um, who knows? So, you know, things are coming up roses for the moment. And... On top of that, we've got Mecham coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm running about eight cars through there, including that 1950 Lincoln. And this one. And uh, this is a 1979 MG, uh, MGB Roadster. And probably it's the nicest MGB I've ever been a part of or seen. And I've seen some nice ones, but this one really kind of takes the cake. And, uh, of course, we'll get into that as we go. But this one will be running across the auction block. Hopefully it delivers. Uh, I ran it through that premiere auction, uh, you know, a month ago, but it didn't do what it needed to. So I ended up taking it home. I just couldn't let it go cheap. I just couldn't. This thing's too nice. And uh, I'd rather crush it than sell it cheap so anyway we'll see what happens but uh and, you know and it's almost too common a car which is weird to say about an obscure british badge uh you know to do a curious cars review but we're gonna do it anyway the hell with it i haven't done an mgb i don't think at least not in recent memory so we're gonna knock this one out and uh, see what it's all about. And we're going to start with the car company. So, you know, MG is obviously a car company. And it's got this incredibly, almost ridiculously complex history. Too complex, really, to get into the minutia of it. I mean, I could spend this whole review just talking about all the different hands that have owned MG over the years. And it's pointless. It's absolutely needless because it just doesn't really matter at all. Uh, but um, the sheer number of different corporate owners and mergers and, you know, restructuring and receiverships and eh, it's just silly. So we'll touch on some of the more important bits and, and keep going. Uh, the name itself stands for Morris Garages. An early 20th century company owned by a man named William Morris. And, you know, in great MG style, William Morris is not the founder of MG. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, his name's on the damn thing and he's not the founder. That honor goes to a guy named Cecil Kimber, uh, who we'll get into. It's just one of those things. Uh, but William Morris was a guy, he started repairing bicycles as an apprentice at age 15 in Oxford, England, where he had moved with his family. And uh, by all accounts, he was very, very good at it. He had a knack for, you know, all things mechanical. And uh, after, you know, making this guy some money, he demanded a pay raise. But, you know, in Pink Floyd money style, you know, they're giving none away. 
uh, he was rejected. So he immediately said, screw you, I'm starting my own thing. He went to his parents, borrowed their garage, and started a bicycle company out of the back of that. And it did pretty well for him. <laughs> I mean, really well. Uh, from those humble roots, it grew. Uh, pretty soon he was out of the garages and into a shop on High Street in Oxford, and then grew beyond bicycles and into motorcycles, including one he designed and built called the Morris Motorcycle. There's a real an original name for it. And from there it went on to cars. Uh, in 1902 he acquired buildings in Long Street, I'm sorry, Long Wall Street. Uh, and he repaired bicycles, he operated a taxi service sold cars, repaired, and rented them. So uh, the guy was a bit of an entrepreneur, and it was all working out pretty well for him. Uh, he held the dealerships ultimately for uh, Errol Johnston, uh, Belsays, Humber, Hupmobile, Singer, Standard, and Wolseley cars. So the guy became quite the you know, big dealer in Oxford at the time. And uh, after making a lot of money doing that, he built a huge new headquarters on Longwall Street and changed the name from Oxford Garage to Morris Garages. And business was absolutely booming. Uh, he had enough money in 1912 that he designed a car. It was called the Bullnose Morris. And uh, he used uh, purchase components from America. Uh, you know, sent for him, shipped him over, started using him in the cars, and uh, then began to build them in an unused military building in uh, Cowley, Oxford. I mean, this guy was just all over the place. Then World War II, or sorry, World War I breaks out. Uh, the factory immediately switches old, over to building munitions. I think they built mines for, uh, you know, the shipping lanes. Kind of a nice thing to do. And uh, it worked well. He probably made some good war money off that. And then in 1919, he resumed building cars. And he was the first British producer to use Henry Ford's moving assembly line. Uh, and this helped him out. He went from building 400 cars in 1919 to making 56,000 by 1925. Uh, so the guy was absolutely rolling along. And uh, he, he, here we go. So here's where we get into MGs. So enter a guy named Cecil Kimber, uh, who Morris had hired to be his sales manager. He had failed at other stuff before. He had made investments. and He was a car guy. Uh, but he had a troubled history, but he was still very talented. So Morris hired him. I think he was a salesman for a couple years. Then he became the sales manager. Then he started rebodying some of these Morris cars to make them more sporty. And that is the true birth of MG. Uh, you know, in typical MG style, even the founding date is a complex sort of gray area that's not really agreed on. Uh, but it seems like most people seem to put it at uh, 19. 1924, when MG sort of at least came into existence, even if not officially. And the first MG, it's called the Old Number One, uh, was made for uh, Kimber himself in 1925. And, you know, it went on from there. So yeah, all of a sudden, supply starts to not keep up with demand. People seem to love these little sporty bodies that Kimber is putting on these cars. And by 1928, the company had become large enough to uh, kind of get its own identity. And that's when the MG Car Company was built, or, you know, at least wasn't incorporated, but that's what they started naming it. And they started putting those famous octagonal badges on the cars. So uh, in October, they took a stand at the London Motor Show. Uh, and loads of orders came in. So all of a sudden, space was an issue again. He had to expand again. And uh, that led Morris to buy this sort of big uh, old leather factory in uh, Abingdon, Oxfordshire, which would become the home for MG all the way through 1980. You know, I mean, it goes beyond 1980, but that was the true run of real MGs uh, from, you know, 1929 through 1980 at that factory. And uh, we'll get into how that ended. Uh, but the basis for these cars was essentially affordable performance. That was where they 
you know, he took these sort of Morris cars, which weren't terribly expensive. He put sporty panels on them. People liked the look of them. They didn't cost a lot, but they were fun to drive. And that would become the theme of MG uh, throughout their entire history, more or less. Uh, and the performance thing was a big deal. I don't they got into racing. There was factory racing, and then they supported privateers who were racing the cars as well. Interestingly enough, the most interesting bit of MG racing history, to me anyway, I'm sure there's much more interesting bits to other people, uh, was uh, in the 1960s, all the way, let's fast forward to then. Uh, in 2007, Toyota joined NASCAR to much fanfare, and people made a big thing out of it. And, you know, they would say, oh, this is the first foreign maker to be in NASCAR since 1963. Well, nobody mentioned what car ran in 1963, what foreign car. Fascinatingly to me, it was an MG. And it was run by a guy named Smokey Cook. Uh, he ran it in the uh, Grand National race in 1963, and I can only imagine, I mean, the thing is obscure enough, there's not even any existing photos of it. Uh, you know, nobody even knows what it looks like anymore. Nobody can find a picture of the car that ran. I can only imagine that thing lining up next to Richard Petty in his big Plymouth, and uh, Petty looking over going, what the fuck is that thing? <laughs> I mean, just to me, that's absolutely fascinating. So before Toyota, the last foreign make in NASCAR was MG. And uh, I just find that extremely interesting. But anyway, back to the pre-war stuff. So Cecil Kimber, uh, he'd end up getting forced out of the company in 1941. Uh, he had a disagreement with Morris. And in 35, it had become... In this is, again, all the complex shit. Morris sold this private little company, MG to his own other big company, Morris Holdings. All of a sudden, you've got shareholders and you've got boards and that sort of thing. Kimber wasn't good at that, so he ended up conflicting with them. Uh, you know, they were building pretty cool cars at the time, including some stuff that would plant the seed for when they really hit it after the war, but uh, they weren't getting along. And in 1941, they had an argument over what, MG would do during World War II, you know, munitions and war stuff, and Kimber was asked to leave. He was just kicked out unceremoniously, you know, a bit like, um, uh, you know, uh, GM kicked out some of the, you know, Dodge and Chevrolet and whatnot, so, or Chrysler and Chevrolet. But anyway, he was kicked out, and then in 1945, he dies in a freak train accident at King's Cross in London, which killed two passengers. He was one of them. Uh, when an engineer screwed up, put a train in reverse, ended up going back to the station, crashing into another train, and smushed the first class compartment, killing Cecil Kimber. So uh, that's the unceremonious end of, of that guy. Uh, but it was after the war that MG really found its, found its footing. Uh, in they had begun making a car called the TA in 1936, which was basically an open-top, two-seat uh, two roadster. And, you know, MG, not just then, now, whenever, they've, they've built coupes, they've built sedans, they've built all kinds of stuff you don't associate with them, because basically what everybody associates with MG are these little, light, two-seat open-topped roadsters that are fun to drive. And that was the TA, which then became the TB. I have to say, the TA midget isn't a very politically correct name. In 1936, it was all very different. So you couldn't name a car the T and A midget today. You know, that would sound like some kind of freaky porn movie. But... Um, Anyway, they, they had the basis for that. After the war, they started building it, and they came out with the TC. And that was the breakthrough car for MG. Uh, it was the first car that was sold globally, or at least in the United States, uh, and in continental Europe. All of a sudden, people really liked this thing. All the GIs returning to America had sort of gotten a take, not all of them, a few of them had gotten a taste for these sort of light, nimble, two-seat roadsters, the likes of which weren't really a thing in the United States. And uh, the MG capitalized on that and started sending these TCs there. That had a big influence on the birth of the SCCA in America. And, of course, MGs were raced 
to great success and, you know, with great prolific use uh, for many years in that series and all kinds of different SECA series, but that's an aside. So anyway, the TC is out, it's selling well, it's affordable, it's fun, it's simple, uh, and even though it's affordable, it, it has appeal to even some of the wealthy, like the, the most famous owner was probably the Duke of Edinburgh at the time, who was often seen driving his MGTC around, and they had different special engines and little racing versions and, you know, all this and that, but I mean, the truth is it was just sort of a car that people liked to drive when they wanted to feel like driving was part of the fun of doing what they want to God I'm rambling oh God anyway so the TC did well that led to the TD which was just a more developed version of the same thing you know running boards side fenders open top fun drive around that was an extremely successful car in America uh, MG was doing quite well and then they went beyond and came out with the MGA, uh, which was the first in the series that would lead to this. And the MGA was a beautiful car. I mean, absolutely without question. Uh, it was full bodied, body on frame, but full bodied. It was sold as a coupe and a roadster. Uh, very, very swoopy. And they ended up selling over 100,000 of them, which was a big number for a little company like MG at the time. Uh, the, it very quickly aged because a lot of competition was coming in. You had Triumph coming in, you had some Italian stuff from Alpha coming in, and uh, frankly, while the MG was gorgeous and fun to drive, those other cars were better built in the sense that they didn't break your spine when you drove them, and that's what the MG did, uh, or sorry, the MGA. So this car, the MGB, was meant to be an evolution of the MGA that addressed its short Shortcomings. So it would have the same fun, it would have the same drivability, but it wouldn't have a suspension that would break your back and it would be a little bit more practical. And uh, it was designed by, um, oh, what the hell was his name? A guy named Hader, hilariously. Don Hader, uh, with help from Pin and Farina. He wasn't the only guy. A bunch of, Don finished it with a, a Pin and Farina, that Italian design house that's famous for Ferraris and such. And they came up with the design. And in 1962, even though some of the stuff on it was backwards and old, a lot of the stuff on it was cutting edge. And the most cutting edge part of this car was that it was... Uh, unibody. It was very early for a unibody car, and it had a monocoque. <sighs> monocoque. To, what is that giant scary bird? I keep heading that way. Uh, but anyway, and it had crumple zones, Mercedes style. So you've got here in 1962, this thing comes out, and it's pretty cutting edge in terms of design. Uh, it's strengthened, it's monocoque, it's crumple zoned, it's unibodied, and um, it uh, drives a lot nicer and a lot better uh, than the MGA. And it sold extremely well, and it was the car that would go the distance, actually beyond the distance. I mean, it begins in the heyday of the company, really, in 1962, and they milk it. Uh, you know, because again, you have to get into the history of MG, which I'm not going to, but it's just this eternal history of getting shuffled between companies and, you know, things not even of its own making. Uh, that are losing money, that are hemorrhaging money, there's strikes, there's strife, there's all sorts of problems. So they keep building the car because it's selling well. It's, you know, now owned by a company called British Leyland, which, uh, you know, get into some other video. And it's one of their few profitable cars, almost as beloved as the Mini Cooper, but the whole company itself is in terrible trouble, so they can't really invest in it. Uh, they can't develop it much, you know, beyond a few mechanical bits. And they run the thing from 1962 all the way through 1980, when the last one rolls off the assembly line with nothing to replace it, no future, you know, MG design. And that's it. They just close the company or, you know, shutter the factory, sell it unceremoniously and dump the whole thing. And uh, by that time they'd sold 500,000 of these things. It was a beloved brand. 
uh, but uh, mismanagement had just screwed the whole thing up. And, you know, then it went through an awkward 1980s. You know, there was some re bad shit. There was something called the RV8, if I remember right, in the early 90s that I thought was really cool looking. Kind of, a, in some ways, to me, the first retro modern car before the Volkswagen, because it looked like this MGB, but was definitively more modern. But it really didn't sell well. Uh, but then they went on to make other sporty stuff. But the 80s was a dark time. The 90s was a rebirth. Then it got shuffled around some more. It was owned by... I'm going to go through the ownership real quick. I mean, here's the companies that have owned MG over the years. You've got Morris Garages Limited. You've got MG Car Company Limited. You've got British Motor Corporation. You've got British Motor Holdings. You've got British Leyland. Austin Rover. The Rover Group. The MG Rover Group. Uh, the Nanjing Automobile <laughs> Company in China. And now its parent company, SAIC Motors. And uh, they're using the MG... Uh, MG badge on EVs and, you know, weird little sporty SUVs that they sell globally. So uh, it just seems crazy to me that this little niche maker of automobiles has been around almost without a break. Uh, for a hundred years. Well, companies like Oldsmobile, Pontiac, AMC, Studebaker have vanished. They're gone. Uh, but MG remains, and it remains even today. And that's kind of a testament, I think, to the people who built it and kept it pure over the years and kept it on task. I mean, it's not really on task anymore, but it's here because of those people who did. The history reminds me a little bit of Maserati, uh, which is another company with an absolutely tortured lineage, uh, you know, very difficult to sort of read up on and care about. Uh, but I tell you what, I'm going to take a break there, and then we're going to get into the styling and the rest of this particular MG. So bear with me one moment. I'll be right back. All right, so let's have a quick look around this car. Again, this is a 1979. It's finished in carmine red, which is sort of a dark, uh, I think, very attractive red color. And uh, as I said, this is probably the nicest one that I've seen in years. Uh, and as we get into it and drive it, I think you'll see that as well. Uh, but uh, the design itself is very simple. Uh, again, it was meant to replace the MGA, which was beautiful. And I don't think this is quite as beautiful, uh, but it's certainly a practical design. I like the big swooping front. It's got, you know, a long front end with big round lamps and a stubby tail, uh, a ridiculous ridiculously short windshield, enough so that it has to incorporate three wipers to be able to clear the whole windshield. Two would be too long. It would hit the top or the bottom, so it had to have three. Same with the MG Midgets, which were made at the same time and uh, were smaller still. Uh, I think it has a lovely use of chrome, more so on the earlier cars. Of course, American regulations impacted MG just like every other car, and uh, they went from having these sort of beautiful and lovely chrome brumpers with a more vertical front end to these sort of big, to me, unappealing rubber things. The nice thing is MG was poor enough uh, that they had to just put these rubber bumpers on over the old body. So it's a really simple conversion to go back to the chrome bumpers. And if this was my car, I'd probably do it, uh, you know, despite its originality. I just think they look better. Uh, but there they are. They're the big five mile an hour bumpers. You see the MG badges. This one has a front plate because somebody loved it. And uh, there's that octagon. Uh, badge at the uh, front top of the bumper. Uh, long hood without a power bulge. You had to have a scoop when they went to the V8 models. This one didn't, and I think it looks better. Uh, you got a nice little chrome air intake there at the back of the cowl. Uh, again, the short windshield, aluminum, uh, very, very nice. You've got chrome smoker windows on the side that angle in and are almost needless. I mean, it would almost be nice if uh, the window just went the whole length of the door and went down, leaving just that little windshield. But I guess that's good for, you know, rollover support or whatever. And again, it's not an unsafe car with the crumple zones. Uh, this one has you know, what a pretty famous style of wheel, the Pan Sport racing wheel. Uh, you know, it would have probably come with Steelys. Wires would have been out by 79, so Steelys were probably the only option. And uh, this guy put on these uh, very classic Pan Sport wheels, which I think look great. And you see the disc brake uh, behind it, uh, which of 
course helps it stop nice. Uh, you know, little door, chrome door handles, aluminum impact strip down the side. You see these marker lights. This is right out of British Leyland. You would have seen those on like every British car of the time. Even Jaguar E-types and stuff would all use the same lights and reverse lights and yeah, it still didn't work to make them profitable. Uh, going to the back, you can see uh, the rubber bumper again, which could be replaced with a chrome one fairly easily. Nice big chrome luggage rack, which unlike that Pimpmobile Eldorado, which had one a while back, you might actually have to use this thing. Uh, you know, two mirrors. Here's something ridiculous. Look at this antenna. I actually have this thing down right now. Look how high this, I don't know if the British have this thing about like signaling airplanes, but I mean, that antenna stands like six and a half feet high or high. I mean, when you extend it, it's freakish and weird. So I'm going to put that back down so it doesn't look as strange as, you know, it could to me. Anyway, so there's that. And, uh, you know, all in all, a pretty good looking car. So let's have a look inside the trunk. Car magazines at the time actually could, I mean, I think it's a simple formula of being light and nimble and a true sports car. But at the time, they were comparing it to the MGA, which was much more of a backbreaker. And they actually considered this thing to be something of like a, a light touring car, a grand touring car, you know, which would include things like Corvettes or Aston Martins. And I really don't know that that's accurate, but I suppose it was at the time. Uh, like all MGs, it has a shitload of parts in the trunk. This is the thing. Every MG I've ever bought, I opened the trunk and there was a shitload of parts in it and a Moss MG catalog, uh, which is there. Why? I don't know. Uh, here's an alternator. Here's another little bag of parts. Uh, you know, it's it's just what you see. This guy, I think, has bought this spare tire cover with the MG badge because he loved his car. In front of that is all the jacking hardware. Uh, it has a tonneau cover. Uh, I, I'll put a picture of it in. I think I took one before for the Meekum site. But this thing covers the whole interior of the car uh, without putting the top up. And you can unzip half of it and drive that. I suppose it has to do with British weather or something. Uh, but anyway, there it is. It's a bitch to put on, by the way. I hate doing it. This one also comes with a hard top, which is a rarity in the MG world. I'm not sure if it's factory or aftermarket, but, you know, it's there. And if you want to have it, you have it. So interesting to drive with that. And of course, they did make these things in coupes as well called the MG GT which is to me a beautiful car. I mean, the styling of it is really, really attractive, almost like a mini Aston Martin or something. But I think it is, beside, it's not the way I'd own it. As cool as it is, I think an MG like this one has to be an open top car. And uh, that uh, is just, you know, cause look, you're driving this thing. The whole point of it is driver involvement, not just in the steering and the braking and the shifting, but you know, the sounds, the sights, the smells, smells, the having the top down, going on a trip through the English countryside on one of the two days a year there where it doesn't rain and enjoying yourself. That is what the point of this car is. So I think it loses something in coupe form. But anyway, let's have a look under the hood. Oh God, it's down here somewhere. There we go. So th this car to me was the inspiration for the Mazda Miata. Now I think, uh, where is the damn hood release? There it is. I think the styling of the Miata weighed heavily on the Lotus Elan more than this car. But I think this car's sum total is the true inspiration for the MG. And this car, this low mileage, you know, almost new MGB, as I drive it around, it feels Miata-like. And uh, that sort of tells me that this is where, you know, what's-his-face got the inspiration for it. But anyway, here it is. So inside, you see this, you know, proper longitudinally mounted four-cylinder engine, just like you would see in the... Now, it's look, it's cast iron block, cast iron head, overhead valve with push rod, so it's not an overhead cam. Uh, I think it... 
it, at some point in the 60s, they tried a twin cam thing, MG, but it failed. It was a miserable engine. It didn't work, and they had to stop doing it. Uh, and they went back to old tried and true here. But uh, it did work fine, and it's very peppy. It puts out like 70 horsepower or something. Uh, but uh, it still is a nice free revving engine connected to a nice smooth shifting four speed going into the Salisbury style, uh, you know, rear end, uh, which, uh, you know, is nicely balanced. You have almost a 50 50 weight distribution. Hilariously, this car has air conditioning, which is kind of the anti MG. You see the compressor down there, and <laughs> it actually works well. Uh, but uh, basically, you've got, you know, you got a little bit of power booster there, it looks like almost on this. Maybe it does have power brakes, but I think the bulk of them don't. And, um, you know, it's all about it's a rack and pinion steering assembly that actually came from a sedan, was used in the MGA, and uh, they did a subframe on it to bolt it in this unibody car. And even though it sort of had pre-war roots in terms of its design, it's considered so nice and light and easy to use, they never changed it. You know, why screw with a good thing? So the steering's just absolutely terrific in this car. Uh, you see the uh, Solex, the Zenith carburetor there, you know, that, that little oil level thing on the top. You have to add oil. And only the British would find a way to make a carburetor leak oil, and they've done so in this car. Uh, but otherwise, it's a very, very simple arrangement. Obviously, with all the emissions in 79, it's become more complex as it is in this car, and it still looks simple. I like the way they've put this little guard in for this weird little plastic condenser fan to run the AC up front, and uh, that would have probably been installed by the dealer back in 79, you know, as as part of an option. And again, these cars were selling pretty well, even when they were long in the tooth. So uh, there it is under the hood. Uh, it does use uh, uh, coil springs up front. It has leaf springs in the back, um, which was uh, a compromise, you know, based on finances and what else they could come up with. But uh, despite not having an independent rear, it still handles tremendously well and becomes very fun to drive, uh, which is something we're going to do now. So let me get my crap in the trunk. We're going to hop in, have a look at the interior, and then go for a spin. So hold on one moment. All right, so let's have a look inside. Under here, of course, is the top, the soft top. Uh, it's just a nice little simple black vinyl throw-up affair that you fling up and fling down like you did in a Miata, and it works great. Uh, you also have a little bit of storage behind the seats, obviously not for Canadians. Let's get in there. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Anyway. There it is. You got some uh, package shelf there where you can put stuff, certainly when the top is up especially. Uh, you could throw a couple of infants back there, but, uh, you know, I can't imagine even a Canadian is going to find a way to stuff himself uh, into that area. So, you know, they'll have to take a separate car. Or you might even have to let one in the passenger seat, but uh, there it is. Uh, the seats, look at all this mess. The seats are nice little bucket affairs, very vinyl-y, but nicely perforated and, you know, supportive enough to be sporty. Uh, being a 79, this one feels a little bit more upmarket, you know, like they'd really sort of been trying to uh, keep up with some of the other makers and look a little bit more highbrow than, you know, one would expect. Uh, you got speakers in the door panels, you got this little bolt-on armrest thing for your elbow up there, another door pull armrest here, this giant unnecessary door pull and lock, and of course a uh, window crank. Uh, they, somebody put a nardy steering wheel in this car. Don't think that's factory, but it's beautifully uh, installed and uh, has a you know, MG badge in it, and yeah, it looks great. These nardy wheels are terrific, and uh, I like to see it. So anyway, look, let's hop in. And it is a little bit of a long way down, but with the top up, it's not that bad. All right, here you can see the instrument cluster. Very, very sporty. You got your oil pressure, your fuel, your tack. You can see it starts hitting the red line at 55, goes to 6. You got a 120 mile an hour speedometer. Um, these are all UK gauges. Not sure if they're Smiths or not in 79, but they are made in the UK, so that means they won't work for long. Uh, they've got 10,000, what, 10,000, almost 11 on the clock of this thing. And uh, as such, it's about the newest feeling MG that I 
I've been in. You got a row of warning lights here in the center. Uh, not sure if this wood paneling is, I doubt it's factory, but God, it looks good enough to be almost. But I have a feeling that's an add-on that the guy did because uh, he thought it looked nice. And the uh, air conditioning install is really beautifully done. You can see you've got vents down here. I'm sure this is an add-on piece underneath the dash and uh, an add-on piece there. And, uh, of course, two matching vents in the center that would have been there anyway. Uh, and the glove box, not that easy to open. In fact, I'm not going to open. It helps to have a key to do it because of the wood thing, which leaves the knob in far enough that it makes it too difficult. So screw it. Uh, there's your interior light. Here's a Panasonic tape deck radio, which almost certainly would have been factory installed. Uh, you know, again, MG's not rich. They're not going to come up with their own radio when they can just buy a bunch from Panasonic and put them in. Uh, nice, thick center console. Uh, cigarette lighter, more climate controls. The AC control is over there. Here's your four-speed shifter, which looks pretty good on the wood panel. And you got a little ashtray there. And then this interesting little center console that opens up see we've got a shim in there for something and uh, you're not really gonna fit a gun in there you're just not probably maybe some kind of a switchblade or big bowie knife or something but gun wise you're in trouble uh, even if you put it in the glove box it's not that easy to uh, get to in a hurry so probably just better stuffing it down the side of the seats there uh, interesting vista out of the uh, windshield with me even being a short guy I still feel like Tom Selleck driving that Ferrari in Magnum PI it's just hilarious I mean you know with the hard top on I hit the top of it with my head I can only imagine a tall guy uh, those three wipers interesting love this little you know windshield bar support that sort of you know reminds me of jag and uh, yeah it's just kind of a neat thing and it keeps the windshield more secure i guess almost looks like a failure of engineering to me and there you see a little uh this is where the tonneau cover clips into on the front, so interesting. Anyway, let's fire it up and go for a spin. I did show you the light switch. It's over there on the side of the steering column, which if you're uninitiated, it will take you a long time to find that. Yeah, fires up. Uh, being the 70s in America, you've got this irritating fastened seatbelt buzzer. You know, kind of the U-boat is sinking type thing if it was German, but uh, it goes away yeah, fast enough. All right, let's get ourselves in neutral. Are we in neutral? Now we're in neutral. Uh, where's the horn? The horn is a push-in thing here. Try and find that in a hurry when you're pissed off at someone. And uh, the steering is, of course, rack and pinion and not power so when you're at a standstill it's not really that easy to turn of course it gets easier as you roll uh, you got nice side view mirrors there on both sides that work well you got these little smoker windows that'll steer air towards you and uh, you know all in all you're gonna be pretty chipper so all right let's go for a spin I tell you what, the driving of this car is what you would expect. The clutch feel is light, the gas pedal is responsive, the brakes are responsive, the steering is very precise, there's very little play in it, and it is just an absolute joy to drive this car down the road. Uh, I'm not going to go crazy on the test drive because with the top down, I know all you're going to hear is wind noise. I should say I'm not going to talk much, so let's just go for a drive and you can get a feel for what it's like. I mean, it's just an absolute joy uh, to drive this car. It reminds me of a Miata in so many ways, except it's got a little more spirit to it. And by spirit, it yeah, basically mean you feel like something could break at any moment. You don't get that feeling in a Miata. Oh, I'm kidding. These cars are actually pretty reliable. And uh, it's just a very, I mean, instant steering response, excellent brakes, nice straight dive. It's a fun car to drive, 
that gives you a lot of driver involvement and really, you know, short of being on a motorcycle, you're not really going to feel any more connected to the road that you're driving on. You're out there, man. I mean, it's got seat belts, but why bother? Let's get out there and see if we've got any traffic. Maybe we'll have time for another couple. Oh, we're in good shape. to bring it to red line you got about 70 horsepower and it really runs out of pep around 5,000 maybe even a little before you don't want to short shift it it's good to keep the uh, fuel system going but by the same time holding it to 6,000 would feel like abuse and there it is so I mean we're talking about a Very fun car to move through the gears. Very enjoyable. Keeps up with modern traffic, okay? And uh, just feels extremely sporty. So, uh, like I said, this one is gonna be at Meekum. I think it's running through on the 8th or 9th. It's Tuesday of the, of the final week. So, if you have an interest in this car, you'll be able to find it at you know the Meekum website. You can bid online, you can come in person. I'm gonna be there. I've got one of those gold badges because I brought a bunch of cars, so I'm going to be exceedingly drunk. And uh, all in all, we're going to have a good time and see if we can find a new home for this MG. So anyway, thank you very much for having a look. Really appreciate it. Won't bore you with any more uh, talk over the wind noise. And uh, we will see you with the next one. Take care.